But um, to be honest, the Higgs boson, um, to, which was the one thing that was like uh, the, the culmination of this phase of discovery, the final piece of the standard model of particle physics, um, was an enormously important discovery. Learning about it is at least as important as mapping the QCD resonances in the 60s. What's up, you scholars of enlightenment? It's 10 years since the discovery of the Higgs boson at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN in Geneva. Now, the discovery of the Higgs was a great milestone in particle physics. It confirmed the mechanism by which fundamental particles acquire their mass and finally experimentally completed the standard model of particle physics. Now, this week saw celebrations of the discovery of that formerly elusive Higgs boson up and down the country and internationally. And indeed, I had the pleasure of attending one such celebration in Edinburgh, Peter Higgs's old stomping ground. But what is the legacy of that discovery? Why was it so important? And where do we go now with the Higgs? These are very important questions. And to help me dig into that, we welcome back a fantastic special guest, Professor Martin Bauer. Martin, how are you doing? Good. Thank you very much for, the, for having me on. It's always, uh, it's always a pleasure, Martin. So just to remind you guys uh, watching, Professor Bauer is a theoretical particle physicist who also works on quantum sensors and dark matter. He's an associate professor at Durham and a science board member for the STFC, the Science and Technologies Facilities Council. He also wrote a lovely piece um, on the Higgs and the 10-year anniversary for the conversation this week, which I will link down in the description and has helped me come up with some uh, some questions today. So, Martin, first, first question for you. In your conversation piece, you describe the discovery of the Higgs boson as, and I quote, arguably the most important result in the history of the field, that being particle physics. Why was the discovery of the Higgs boson so important that we're now having 10 year anniversaries for uh, for a Nobel Prize? Why do you see it as such a, a phenomenal accomplishment and an important discovery? I think there are two reasons. Um, one, from a more theoretical point of view, the Higgs boson really is no ordinary particle. Mm. It is the only particle that uh, does not have spin, all other particles in the standard model have spin. And the whole standard model of particle physics, the theory that underlies all the phenomena um, at the smallest scales, would not be complete without the Higgs boson. So um, Sam has it up here, and there are <laughs> other particles there as well. There are quarks and uh, leptons, and there are other gauge bosons in the um, uh, standard model, uh, but all of them require the Higgs for really consistent theory. And um, we have been at points before where we were looking for other particles, but rarely was the consistency of, or did the consistency of the whole theory depend on us mm. discovering it. Mm. That's what makes the Higgs boson so special. And from an experimental point of view, it really was the long longest hunt for any um, elementary particle. We have known that the Higgs boson has to be there for this theory to work since the 60s when Peter Higgs together with others predicted it. Um, but uh, many, many experiments have looked for it and um, uh, came uh, up short um, of, of discovering the Higgs boson. Sometimes when we're really, really close to doing it, but they, they didn't manage to. Um, and uh, there have been cases where people thought they had found the Higgs boson <laughs> yeah. and turned out it was wrong. Yeah. So it is, uh, it is also a long and very um, uh, uh, difficult experimental process to uh, discover the Higgs boson. And the, the fact that it has finally happened is, of course, a huge triumph for CERN and the Large Hadron Collider. Mm. So without, as, as you were kind of alluding to there, without this Higgs boson, our whole kind of theoretical framework of the standard model, our understanding of particle physics at the smallest scales kind of breaks down. The, the strength of the interaction between any particle and the Higgs field directly affects a fundamental property of that particle, its mass, right? So we're talking about something that has um, knock-on impacts on the fundamental properties of atoms, the sizes of atoms, the timescales of radioactive decay, and therefore proton stability, the size of atoms, the, the timescales of stars, these kind of things. So without this Higgs boson being there and this Higgs field, which it's related to, there, there wouldn't be a universe as, or at least a universe as we know it for us to, for us to live in. It really is that fundamental. Is that fair? 
Yes, that's absolutely fair to say. I mean, you, a comparison, for example, that might work is with the periodic table. Mm. So you could imagine, we, we understand the periodic table quite well. We have a good model for how electrons are distributed mm. on the shells of atoms and what this means for the properties of the different atoms. Now, we could imagine that one of them um, wasn't there. Like we could predict, for example, um, say silicon or yeah. maybe something that has less uh, everyday use for us, but um, <laughs> one of them just being a gap, right? Yeah. And, and that would not disqualify our model. That would, yeah. that would put into question why that specific gap yeah. exists. And maybe there's some mechanism we haven't understood, yeah. but all the other parts of the periodic system would still be in place. Yeah. Now, if you, if you take the standard model of particle physics and you take the Higgs boson out, like you say, mm. and the Higgs field, which is, which is associated with the Higgs boson, then everything changes. All the other, um, all the masses of the particles um, vanish, um, maybe apart from neutrinos, where we don't yet understand where they get their masses from precisely. Mm -hmm. But um, we wouldn't just have one um, particle for electromagnetism, like the photon, but there would be other very light um, degrees of freedom, like the Z boson or the W, um, that would have huge um, consequence for everyday life. And like you say, there wouldn't be any structure in the universe. We would have a completely different situation. We wouldn't even exist if the Higgs boson wasn't there, unle unless there's another much more complicated theory that could replace it. So it really is that important for understanding of nature at these scales. And, and you you alluded to in your in your explanation there of the, of the two points, kind of an, a, another aspect of this, why people are, are so engaged with this, um, the story of the Higgs boson from the science side and from the, from the, the kind of non-expert side as well, is that it's been a really emotional, personal human journey as well from the from the 1960s so so peter came up with this idea that there would be this higgs boson that showed that this higgs field existed in the background and and that was where particles got their mass from but this was in 1964 and i think lep didn't even start running until 1989 to try and look for this thing you um on, on twitter put out a a beautiful um message from the end of one of those higgs papers was that we apologize to experimentalists for having no idea what the mass of the Higgs boson is. So people didn't even start looking for this thing for another sort of 25 years. And it's been, what, 60 years, uh, 50 years when we actually discovered it to actually find this thing. Do you think, do you think part of the interest and, and sort of romance, if you will, behind this discovery has been that length of time and the fact that as particle physicists, we almost, we almost ran with an assumption for 50 years. And it was a, a sense of relief, if anything, as well, to find it. Yeah, it's, it's very rare that you have no direct signal of something <laughs> that a theory predicts. Yet yeah. a whole field is absolutely convinced that uh, what we're doing is right. And it's, uh, again, uh, it, it points to the importance of this particle, because um, we knew from indirect tests, from the fact that all these other particles have masses, um, we could um, deduce indirect evidence for the Higgs to be there, mm. but um, it's it, to produce it directly, as you say, has has uh, taken decades of experimental work. Mm. And um, the, what what you the, the quote that you just mentioned about the apology to experimentalists <laughs> is one of the most important um, reviews on the properties of the Higgs bosons that uh, was only finished in the 70s. Mm. And one of the reasons is actually that we did not have a guiding principle for the mass of the Higgs itself. Mm. We had an upper bound. We knew it couldn't be infinitely heavy. It, it had to be around somewhere, but it could have been much lighter. Yeah. And indeed, there were some searches early on that looked for very light Higgs bosons that would appear in the decay of other particles. But it, people were convinced soon that that couldn't be the case. It just wasn't there, so it had to be heavier. And um, the Higgs itself is heavier than, uh, than it's an elementary field, but it's heavier than many atoms. So it's really not trivial to produce. It takes a machine like the Large Hadron Collider. Um, to, to actually produce it. And then there's the personal story of uh, Peter Higgs that you're showing, who is quite a character as well. <laughs> so um, he's being quoted by saying that um, in the modern field of theoretical physics, he would have never gotten a faculty job. And he's probably right, because in his whole career, he has published about nine scientific papers, <laughs> which is really, um, I don't know, uh, your listeners and, and the people that watch this um, show are probably well aware that this doesn't um, doesn't doesn't compare to what people publish nowadays, um, and even at his time, there wasn't very much. So that really was his one big achievement of such grave importance that the Higgs boson is named after him, yeah. and um, um, he basically waited all his life for this discovery as well. So yeah, it is an intriguing story beyond just the importance for particle physics too. I, I always I always mention um, in in my show and when I'm explaining this to people, and and I think I've got the history right, 
that the reason that the reason Peter got his name on it was because he came up with the idea that this particle would be a natural consequence of that Higgs field existing in the background. And therefore, it was a, an experimental portal for us actually to, to find that field without that Higgs boson popping in and out when we do our proton collisions we wouldn't have those that smoking gun to show that that field existed. So he actually gave a way to experimentally show that this this mechanism was operating. Is that is that correct as you understand the, the history of it as well? Yeah, that is right. So in 64, there were actually three papers um, published by different groups, um, Peter Hicks, Engler, Braut, um, Guralnik. Um, there, there were a few others that, that were on these original papers and they explained the mechanism, how mass has come about. Mm in the in the standard model, how you can actually have masses for elementary particles because if you think about it it's not it's not the same concept of mass that we have for everyday things when we talk about the mass of a macroscopic object like a table or a person basically we are expressing it in units of things that are smaller that have a certain unit mass right so it's that many pounds or something so what is a pound a pound is the mass of some other object and you can you can play that game and get arbitrarily small you can tell people how much they weigh in terms of mass of separate <laughs> atoms say, right but elementary particles have no structure so they are elementary they are basically point like objects you cannot say it weighs like three times as much as something smaller there is nothing smaller yeah. for elementary particles mass is a is a is a more fundamental concept it is um it is described by how they interact with the uh, with this background field that is the higgs field and that was that was discovered in 1964. It was inspired by condensed matter um, physics, where this mechanism was understood in, in superconductors. Mm. But these people translated it in relativistic theories that also work at these um, high energy scales and, and small length scales. And then Peter Higgs had a paper in '66 um, where he where he realized that, um, as as it's the case in all quantum field theories, if you have a field. Um, that field can be excited. So what we describe as particles in mathematically is the excitation of a field that permeates uh, space and time. And if you have an electron in a, in a certain place, that basically means that you have an excitation, a quantum excitation of this field moving around. And um, Peter Higgs realized that has to be the case for the Higgs too. Yeah. Um, but in order to get such an excitation, um, to produce such an excitation for, for a quantum field, you need to put energy in the field. And that is easier for some fields and harder <laughs> for others. So it's it's um, an, an electron and a positron pair can be produced with an energy that's twice their mass. And that is less than a percent of what you need for the, for the Higgs boson. So it is, it is a completely different ball game if you want to produce these very heavy particles. Yeah. Um, in addition, we didn't know the mass, as I said. So it, 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 that's why it was a long hunt. But yes, it was him who realized that the particle had to be there. And that's obviously why he was rewarded and uh, why also his name is associated with the particle itself. Yeah, it's amazing that he had this this insight, and then we just couldn't we couldn't kind of access it for such a long time because of the uh, the technological requirements there uh, to get that. So it really is an amazing history of that. There was there was one other point I wanted to mention on this because you you flagged this up on Twitter as well that this is the only fundamental particle. Well, we we assume fundamental particle. I'm saying fundamental particle at the moment. We'll talk about composites and, and things later, but the only fundamental particle, as far as we're aware, that actually has the name of an individual. Um, did you discover, well, there isn't anywhere else to look, I guess. It's the only one that has the name of an individual, right? There's, there's no other people were mentioning things like goldstone bosons and such like this, but these are more categories of particles or descriptions of groups of particles. Yeah. The, I mean, clearly some, some categories and some groups of particles, some properties like fermions and bosons, they are named now yeah. by, by, um, the names come from famous physicists as well. But um, the individual particles in the standard model, the top quark, the electron, they all have names that are not associated with who predicted or discovered them. They're associated with their properties or they are just names that were um, basically invented by the people that, um, that uh, predicted them in the first place. But the Higgs boson, beyond being the most central and important piece of the standard model, is also the only one that's named after a person, mm. which is a bit of a sad story too, because um, one aspect um, also of Peter Higgs' life is that um, he really did not want to become famous. Yeah, yeah. So obviously he wanted his idea to be proven right. Um, but um, he, he, he um, if, if you follow him 
um, he, um, he, the speech that he gave and what he said when he won the Nobel Prize had a very sad aspect to it because he basically um, accounted his private life to be over at that point, yeah. which is true for many um, people that win the Nobel Prize. It puts it in the center of attention and you basically can't go anywhere without that following you, at least in academic circles. Um, so that is, uh, that is certainly right to some degree. I think I think his biography was called um, elusive, or, or or there was a there was a review of his right. work that was called elusive because he's very, uh, you know, he likes to to keep himself to himself. So yeah, an amazing amazing history, an amazing personal story, and a and a kind of big sigh of relief to uh, to finally find it. So I guess that that moves us on to the kind of science. So what do we know about the Higgs now that we didn't know just before twenty twelve? So. If I go on to this plot, we 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 know that it exists, right? We've got this we've got this signal of the Higgs. We see particles decaying. If we reconstruct their masses to a point, we can uh, we can rediscover that there's a that there's a, there was a particle there. We know there's a new particle. We we know its mass as well, 125 GeV, um, which determines the particles that it can decay into and the the frequency with which it will do that. And it's also quite a nice experimental value right because it, if it was if it was any higher or any lower we might not see certain certain decays what what else do we know about this this higgs that we didn't know in in 2012 we know quite a lot more so um when it first was discovered precisely because we didn't know at which mass this would happen yeah. it wasn't even clear what the signal would be yeah um theorists could easily calculate um the the expected signal depending on its mass yeah but that changes quite a lot so um, if the Higgs was twice as heavy, or even just 50% heavier than its uh, mass, at which point it was uh, discovered eventually, um, we wouldn't have seen it in the, um, with the signature it was discovered in. So the, the Higgs appeared first in the Large Hadron Collider, decaying into two very energetic photons yeah. that you could detect, and then you could sum up their, um, their energy and recalculate the mass of the Higgs boson. But the, that really only works in a window um, around the mass where the Higgs eventually was discovered, yeah. because if it if it were a bit heavier, then it could decay into these two Z bosons, like, like shown in this graphic here. Yeah. Um, it can, still can do that, but it would do that basically every single time. Yeah. And um, because, because it, it wants to couple it, because yeah. it wants to couple to those heavier particles more strongly yes, because precisely. that's that's the way it works. Yeah, that, that also makes it so hard to produce, right? You mm. first have to produce these heavy particles yeah. that interact with the Higgs, and yeah. they can then excite the Higgs field um, <laughs> to produce the Higgs boson. It really is challenging. That is also unique about it. You, you think about other particles that interact with um, charges, for example, the, the photon, the light particle interacts with electric charges. So you can easily calculate its interaction strength. Either something has electric charge, um, or not, yeah. right? So that, that gives you a way to calculate it. Yeah. The Higgs boson, because it is responsible for the masses of the particle, mm. interacts more strongly the, the heavier the elementary yeah. particles are. It's more it's of a continuous spectrum, like of yeah. interaction spectrum. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not, uh, and, and, and then also depends on the Higgs mass itself. Mm. So um, we're actually quite lucky. You, you just mentioned that um, uh, in that one remark. The fact that the Higgs is at 125 uh, giga electron volts at that precise mass, we can measure many, many of its couplings. Yeah. If it was much heavier or much lighter, that wouldn't be the case. So it's kind of a present of nature that it's there. <laughs> we can actually convince ourselves that it's the Higgs boson. I mean, that you would want to measure all these properties to be sure. It could have been something unexpected too. Most or many particles that we've discovered, if you actually didn't expect them to be where or what they are, right? The, yeah. the muon being the most famous example, it just happens to uh, produce something and it, uh, it could have been anything. But uh, since it was discovered in 2012, we have measured quite a few of the couplings of the Higgs boson with a um, very nice precision. And that allows us to show, yeah, that, that figure there on the right is the best way to demonstrate this. So what, what is shown there on the x-axis is the different masses of the particles. And on the y-axis is the interaction strength with the Higgs. Mm -hmm. And that's why um, you have this, uh, this nice direct relation between the mm -hmm. two that you expect if the prediction of the standard model is right, if this is really the Higgs boson, all these little measurements to overlap with that red line. Yeah, you can see we have we have now access to the couplings to muons and taus, which is because they are um, they are leptons and they are easier to yeah. uh, to measure the muon in particular bottoms and the the electric gauge bosons and the top four, and that now gives us a lot of confidence that it really is the Higgs boson and and not something that is close enough but maybe an unexpected 
um, surprise over the last half of the life. <laughs> it's very important not to fall into uh, correlation is causation, right? We need to uh, actually check that the properties of this thing are uh, are what we would expect of a of a Higgs boson within the within the theory that we have. It's, it's interesting you mentioned these um, calculating the uh, the decay rates and such as a function of mass because. Obviously, when when I was going through um, university in two thousand three, two thousand four, we were um, we were shown these plots of branching ratios, but of course we didn't know the mass. So there were these these horrible mass versus branching ratios with lines going everywhere, and it was you, you essentially had to draw a, draw a kind of line a slice and then say, well, if the Higgs is this mass, then this will be. I remember doing a, an entire exam question on it. Um, but they were so different depending on where the masses were. And as you say, luckily we've uh, we've uh, we've got a, a Higgs mass present from nature, which has helped us to um, to actually look a lot at these couplings. Presumably, going into the future, we'll want to get these couplings for the um, the uh, the lower mass quarks as well. I guess I guess that's difficult at a at a hadron collider with all the the mess and such. Yeah, that, that will be tremendously challenging, um, not only because the couplings are so small and mm. rarely decays into these particles in the first place, but also because it's not quarks that you detect in a, in a, in a collider. Um, quarks are never free. They immediately bind into um, protons, neutrons, mesons, mm. and that's what eventually shows up in the collider. But it is not a one-to-one -one correspondence to find what quark has been produced and what hadrons are eventually um, showing up in the detector. Mm. So this is really tricky already for the heavier quarks and people are trying to do this for the charm now yeah. um, and have succeeded for the for the bottom quark, but that is um, incredibly challenging experimentally. But there's one interaction though that we are definitely after because it has deeper implications than just checking whether the Higgs boson is the Higgs boson mm. um, and that is the Higgs interaction with itself. Mm. So um, there's one prediction of the standard model that says the Higgs is not um, completely independent from the Higgs field. In fact, it is also responsible um, for the mass of the Higgs boson itself. Mm. And that means that if you have a Higgs boson, it, energetic enough Higgs boson, it should be able to excite the Higgs field itself. Oh. And for example, produce two Higgs bosons um, um, at some point. And that interaction fixes some para parameters in the theory, which are responsible to understand the underlying mechanism um, for, the, for the generation of mass. So at the moment, we understand that the Higgs boson is, in fact, an excitation of the Higgs field. But we, if we want to learn how the Higgs field behaves and what really is the minimum of this, um, um, of this potential, so what explains how these masses come about eventually, we would want to access the Higgs interaction with itself mm. that, it, that gives you direct access to these parameters. Amazing. And, and just before we go on to the sort of the future where we might be able to go with this, it, it would be fair to say now as well, people talk about the four fundamental forces. We we do have a fifth force now, right? It's mediated by the exchange of the Higgs boson. Um, it's a force that's stronger for heavier particles quantitatively. Is it is it fair to say we've got a, a fifth force here? People would talk about colloquially. Yeah, absolutely. It is. I mean, it's to some point a degree. It depends on how you um, how you define a force. Of course. So there are very specific definitions where you narrow it down to only spin one bosons, and then maybe the Higgs would be excluded. But uh, when you talk about forces, you're talking about lower energies. Like when we experience forces, we we don't talk about high energy experiments and high energies. Really, you talk about the interactions of particles. That this this um, whole language is a bit misplaced. Yeah. But if you go to lower energies, the exchange of Higgs bosons looks very similar to the exchange of these spin one bosons as well. So you would clearly call it a force. Uh, the only reason it is not very important for our everyday life, the, this Higgs force is that it is very short range, yeah. like most yeah. forces are. Um, and also it does not change the character of particles like the W boson, for example, that can um, uh, take like turn if you look at this at this figure that you have there yeah. on the left with the first second and third generation the w can jump between them yeah. the higgs can't do that so there are certain decays that the w produces the neutron decays because of the w mm -hmm. um, the higgs can't do uh, can't can't produce a neutron decay at least as far as we know so that force has has less um importance mm -hmm. for everyday life we don't feel it like we would feel the magnetic force or the gravitational force say but it is still there so if, if you go to very short distances mm -hmm. if you could probe, for example, very precisely also within atoms, the force that binds the electron, there would be a tiny correction by the exchange of, of Higgs bosons. 
It almost it almost seems to behave, and I, I know obviously it's it's very very complicated. Almost seems to behave sort of like a very very short scale gravity because it, it scales with the mass of the particle. But obviously it's incredibly straight rate at uh, short range. It isn't gravity, just to be clear to to uh, to everyone out there. But it it seems to behave in in some ways like it. Is that is that fair, or is that is that reaching a little bit? Well, I, yeah, we well, have to be really careful not to, um, uh, to um, it can be confusing. So gravity um, only, you, would, you wouldn't say gravity couples to masses, gravity really couples to energy, right? Oh, so, yeah, so for example, um, yeah, what, what a fact that gravity was, was, uh, was actually discovered or proven right, the general theory of relativity by, by showing how light bends in the gravitational field. Mm -hmm. And photons, and light particles, are massless. Yeah. So that um, that is a careful distinction. The Higgs boson directly couples to the mass yeah. as if it was a charge of the particle. Yeah, exactly. um, but you're right. I mean, if you go again to if you're talking about a low energy regime where where we mainly the, the most part of the energy is their masses, then there are certainly parallels between the couplings of the Higgs boson and the graviton. So so moving moving forward from there then. We we've talked about the properties of the of the Higgs that we have kind of nailed down and 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 kind of a beautiful Occam's razor at the moment. It seems to be the simplistic uh, standard model Higgs. Everything seems to line up, and you know this is the Higgs boson that we predicted. What properties of the Higgs boson or or, or the Higgs mechanism do we still need to probe, kind of measure and understand going forwards? I guess we would like to to fill in as much of this this diagram as we could um, to make sure we we do have the standard model Higgs. Are there uh, are there other things that we we want to look for? You mentioned something like uh, composite Higgs as well, which might be a, a possibility. Yeah, so so we want to fill in this diagram um, because if just one point on the diagram diverts from this line, uh, it's not the standard model Higgs or at least not only the standard model Higgs. If there's just a single particle for which this does not agree, um, the whole theory um, needs to be extended. And uh, that, of course, is a very important thing to know because we rely on this theory for um, basically every calculation at these short scales. So that is something we certainly want to do. Mm -hmm. um, we want to measure the Higgs self-coupling because the mass of the Higgs has a second consequence. It is slightly too light <laughs> for this phase of the universe that sets all these masses to be a stable configuration. So there's an effect, the quantum mechanical effect that is called tunneling. If you, um, uh, for example, alpha decay, it's, it's not something I want to go into detail now, but um, in, in quantum mechanics, if you have a potential, a particle can tunnel through even if it doesn't have enough energy to overcome it classically. It's like the famous, uh, a wave can go through a wall. A ball cannot jump through a wall if I throw it against it, but in the quantum world, this can happen. So for the Higgs boson, that means at the mass that we have measured and including all the other parameters that we know from Large Hadron Collider and other experiments, um, we are not quite sure whether this minimum is stable. And that can have um, important consequences. So for example, um, a good analogy would be the different phases of water, like water can be a gas, can be a solid, mm. can be ice, or it can be liquid. And uh, if you compare this with a phase our universe is in, we would be very, pretty close to the point where it could jump from one phase to another. <laughs> right? So we, we would want to know this. This eventually tells us something about how the uni universe works and uh, that is an important thing to find out. That is actually something we can learn if you measure the Higgs self-coupling. That's why this is such an important um, parameter. And the composite Higgs topic, of course, is, is another open question because as I mentioned at the beginning, the Higgs boson has no spin. And we never ever have seen a fundamental particle having no spin. Mm. That is quite, quite rare. In fact, we have seen particles with no spin before, but every single time we have discovered something like this, it turned out that they were composite particles made of even smaller things <laughs> that are bound by some force. Yeah. Right. So usually the strong force, but even atoms. There are atoms that are that don't carry spin, and they don't carry spin because the spin of the proton, the electron that bind into the atom, yeah. cancel out precisely. Now, something like this could be going on for the Higgs as well, and that, for example, would be um, uh, would predict a change, you know, slight changes in the couplings to different elementary particles. Mm -hmm. It would also predict other resonances at high energies. Um, usually when you have bound states, you have a ground state, which you could associate mm -hmm. with the Higgs, but then you have excited states as well, mm -hmm. right? Maybe even that they, they could even carry different spin. 
because there are different ways two particles can be bound into a um, into a composite object. So we would be looking for these to uh, to see whether the Higgs might just, be just like the levels, possible. the electron shells in an atom. I guess there's there's different states that you can you can be in. Yeah, for example, yeah, it's a, it's a good comparison. So you can have whenever you have a bound state, you can have different excitations of that state, and those in principle would show up. We can calculate how what you would need to find yeah. them. So far, we haven't seen them. But that tells you something on how how um, um, compact, how strong the Higgs would be bound if it was composite. But it could be fundamental too. We just don't know. This is an important question for us to understand whether our our um, our theory at, at, at the smaller scales needs to be extended to understand this correctly, or whether it is correct for um, for a long range of energies um, at least. Lots of interesting things to look at. The the question is: should should we should we now be moving towards a future E plus E minus collider to specifically produce Higgs bosons and study them in a much cleaner environment and nail down their properties? Or do we want to be looking for another discovery machine to find out more about the Higgs? What's your, what's your thoughts on that? So this is an, uh, an open question in the, in the community, as you know, and many people have different um, opinions. Yeah. It depends on what your goals are. And the plus e minus collider um, you could, would, would operate an energy um, that makes it a Higgs factory. It would just keep producing Higgs as basically you would, you would run it at an energy that is precisely tuned such yeah. that you have as many Higgs boses as possible, precisely to study its properties. Yeah. It's a much cleaner environment. You, you have electrons and positrons annihilating and you get something out that usually you can identify everything that comes out of this process. In a Hadron Collider, you can go to much higher energies than an electron-positron collider. Um, and you, you basically um, have a much messier environment. So since they are made of quarks, mm -hmm. usually they produce a bunch of things beyond the one thing that you might yeah. want to see. And you really have to find the needle in a haystack to to get it out. So they're but really good for out. discovery because you've got these range of energies, like like throwing two bags of potatoes at one another and you produce all this rubbish. So really good right. for discovery. But if you want to do something, um, some precise work at a particular on a particular decay, how are you going to get that? So really good for discovery at Hadron Colliders, really bad for precision. And the opposite, a lepton collider, where you've got very, very clean interactions between two leptons but not necessarily good for discovery because you don't have that range of energies. Yes. And given the time it would take to build the next Hadron Collider, yeah. it, um, it would almost be irresponsible to not, not try to first um, go for an E plus E minus machine in some realization, right? Especially since we know now at what energy we need to run it to yeah. um, produce as many Higgs bosons as possible. There are now many variations for that, and I'm not uh, married to any of them, yeah. but I really think that this is the, the right way forward. People, people like to. We, we have some lively debates on Twitter, but really we want to uh, we want to see everything we can uh, we can get hold of. People have a lot of uh, opinions on on the best place to go first, which is which is fair enough. That's how science works. I get. I guess the next the next question, Martin, is is as we go forward with this, what what else can we use the Higgs boson for? So we've had some lively discussions on Twitter this week, which is always the case between different views on this. Can we use the Higgs as a probe of beyond standard model physics? And, and what might that look like? Obviously, you're on the theory side, so I'm, I'm guessing you have many ideas as to how we might do this. Right. So, so the Higgs certainly is a probe of the mechanism on how electric symmetry is broken. It is the probe for that because it is the agent of electric symmetry breaking. Yeah. So if you want to understand whether that works precisely as predicted in the standard model, or whether there's new physics associated with that. For example, the fact that the Higgs could be a composite particle, yeah. um, on, or if you will, supersymmetry would also be a, um, a version of that. Then using the Higgs to study that is obviously a, um, a basically a given. So it's the, it's, the, it's the right thing to do. But there are also other ways and other questions that could be answered um, by studying the Higgs boson. I say could because it really, really depends yeah. on uh, whether the theories we have are true. Um, one big question is uh, dark matter. Yeah. So dark matter is a substance which we have not produced in any lab experiment um, yet. We have tried many, many times, but we haven't. And we are absolutely convinced that it is present in the universe. Um, we measure its, its presence at very different scales, usually through gravitational effects. It's the only, uh, not usually, it's the only way we have seen it so far. Um, uh, but the beautiful rotational so curves of... Uh... Yeah. of galaxies and, and how they, they don't flatten out as quickly as you would expect them to. Yeah, rotational curves. And then 
um, uh, even if you try to explain this with something that is not dark matter, um, in the very early universe when it was extremely hot and dense, um, galaxies needed to start forming. And then this very hot and dense environment, whenever you have gravity pulling things together that interact with light, with radiation, the radiation pressure pushes it apart again. It's the same, same mechanism that makes the sun big, right? The sun is, is a very heavy object. So in principle, why isn't it denser and clumped more together like a stone, right? It's a gas giant. If you will it's it's a um, um uh, it's, it's a gas cloud that is held, held together by gravity but the fact that it has that size is that that uh, balance between radiation pressure and um and the push inward by gravity so back then you can show that um normal matter bionic matter matter that interacts with radiation couldn't have ever clumped that way to initiate forming of galaxies you need something that does not have um radiation pressure that pulls it apart and uh, pushes it apart and that other thing that would be dark matter. So even our explanation of how galaxies, how all the structure in the universe came about, desperately need a dark form of matter, or, or rather um, a non-luminal form. Dark is even a bad word because it, 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 people think it's like it's something that is that is black or um, uh, yeah. just has a, interacts differently. But it really means that it's um, incredibly difficult to see at all. Yeah. Um, that, that's how the name is to be understood. But we know it's there. Um, we don't know how it interacts with us other than gravitationally. Mm -hmm. Now, because the Higgs is a spinless particle, yeah. it has yeah. special properties. And one of these properties is that for many candidates of dark matter, like the objects that have the right quantum numbers to be a dark matter candidate, the Higgs would interact with these particles. Yeah. Um, or there's, there's at least a um, high probability that that is the case based on what we have seen in, the, in these theories. So now, um, for example, for 10% of all decays of the Higgs boson, a bit more at the moment, roughly 10, uh, we don't even know what it decays into. So we, we can collect the particles the Higgs decays into, but we know we produce more Higgses than we, than we um, collect the, um, the final state particles for. So what, what could that be? And uh, some people have theories um, that, that this could be some part or maybe all of dark matter that we observe in the universe. Um, if that is the case, there's no other way to discover that than produce it through Higgs bosons mm -hmm. um, uh, directly. Uh, but, but there are many ifs and uh, conditions associated with that. Clearly, if it is not something that interacts with the Higgs, and there are theories for that as well, we won't discover it there. But it is one way to use the Higgs boson as a portal into a dark sector, a potential portal, that we definitely should uh, have a look at. Because there's just one place in the world that can produce the Higgs boson <laughs> at the moment, that's the Large Hadron Collider. If we, if we don't go and look there, and it is there, we will, uh, we will just miss it. There's, there's so many open questions in this, uh, in this lovely Nature article that you, uh, you linked to today, yesterday, I think that um we could we could go through all day um i'm particularly interested in are there charge parity violating Higgs decays as, a, as an old lhcb guy so uh so yeah i mean it, it seems like such a an important point and i guess because the the higgs boson um dark matter is not charged the higgs boson has a kind of unique way of interacting with uncharged matter it's always going to be a portal into the, or a potential portal into that world depending on what what nature has given us and it should be something that we uh that we explore and take seriously yeah i agree um also what you mentioned about the charge parity violating decay is a very important issue mm. we haven't seen a charge parity violating decay of the higgs boson the standard model does not predict any mm. but we know the universe is made from matter and just a little bit of antimatter comes with it right mm. so wherever you look all the galaxies everything is matter um could of course there's always the possibility that for whatever reason in the early universe um, uh, there was only matter and antimatter was never produced, right? But in most cases, when we try to replicate what happened there, we was if we have a collider, for example, and we go to very high energies, we collide heavy particles, you produce matter and antimatter pretty much in one to one correspondence. If that happened in the early universe, everything would immediately annihilate again. And again, you wouldn't have structure. That's another condition that is necessary for, for structures like galaxies and um, and our our, um, our solar system planets to form, right? You need to get rid of either all matter or all antimatter to make that happen. And uh, we can calculate how often this would be predicted by the standard model, and it's not enough. Yeah. The standard model as it is, there's a tiny component where antimatter behaves differently than matter, yeah. but it's by far it's not enough to explain this huge disparity that we observe in the universe. So that is basically a prediction that the standard model um, does not get right. There is something that is missing there. And that something could be the case of the Higgs boson, which make a difference between matter and antimatter, 
that in the early universe contributed to that imbalance that we observe. Mm -hmm. There is again no guarantee that that is the case, yeah. but there is only one way to find out. That's why we have to look for it. Exactly right, and that brings me on to my very, very final question, which I guess is is a sort of controversial question in our in our field at the moment. Um, I think I know where both of us sort of lie that we we just keep going and we keep looking for things because nature throws us uh, curveballs all the time. But I want to talk about the the Higgs boson's kind of legacy in terms of the future of the field of particle physics. So there are many scientists, serious people, who seem to think that finding only the Higgs boson, well, and, and that's not really true either, or, or finding mainly the Higgs boson at the LHC means we haven't found much new physics um, and pushing forward with a new, larger, more powerful discovery machine, something like, for example, the, the Future Circular Collider, is, is not really the way that we should be going. How would you, how would you respond um, to those ideas and, and I'm guessing in the negative, given what we've just said. And uh, uh, yeah, basically, how would you respond to those ideas? Yeah, I think um, it's a bit of a, of a pet peeve of mine. So particle physics is particularly um, critical in that regard. I gave right? you a so bit of a would... flick on Twitter. I was not being yes. particularly serious as well. <laughs> yeah. So I apologize. But, but if, you look at, if you look at other experiments that are also expensive that we build, right? Um, sometimes all they do is confirm what we expect. We have shot a satellite to Pluto yeah. that's taken nice pictures of Pluto, but it basically has confirmed that it is a big cold rock <laughs> at the outer parts of the solar system, right? Yeah. They did not discover alien life on Pluto or something like this. Yeah. Right? We still got to keep looking for that, for example, but they were not uh, um, completely frustrated by the fact that it confirmed the, the theory. Yeah. Particle physics is a bit yeah. special because there was a time in the 60s yeah. um, and, um, and, and before where basically every other week yeah. you had a discovery. Yeah. It, it's, you, you can see it in the record of the, uh, of the Nobel Prizes. It gets to like the 50s, 60s, and it just goes like, and just yeah. explodes. It, it, it just... It is this is an absolutely unique time in history where, where our, um, um, our technology um, got to a level where we yeah. started to discover elementary particles. Yeah. Right? So that, that, is, that is something that hasn't happened before to that regard. I'm not aware of any science, maybe genetics as well, but say within physics, I'm not aware of a, of a period where um, uh, that many discoveries accumulate in a very short amount of time. We learn that much new things. Yeah. Um, and, and honestly, for a long time, this field was a bit spoiled by that fact that that happened. So whenever there was a new machine, people would expect discoveries left and right. Yeah. And then came a period of time where that didn't happen. Yeah. We had theories that were interesting. Some people were strong believers that, um, that they would materialize it at new colliders, like supersymmetry, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're, we're really frustrated when that didn't happen. Um, there were also mistakes being made by these people in um, advertising new colliders, for example, because they were so convinced of their prediction that they thought it had to show up. Yeah. But um, to be honest, the Higgs boson, um, it, which was the one thing that was like uh, the, the culmination of this phase of discovery, the final piece of the standard model of particle physics, um, was an enormously important discovery. Learning about it is at least as important as mapping the QCD resonances in the 60. Mm -hmm. I would equate measuring every single Higgs coupling um, to be more important than to discover um, the K on or um, mm -hmm. uh, say, say the omega or other like composite states that were discovered in the 60s to complete the picture of, um, of QCD. So I think um, that alone makes it very, very important. On the other hand, um, technology of course has its limits. So with this technology, very likely, there's one other big collider we can build. We won't go beyond this um, un unless things uh, rapidly change. But we have seen these things change before as well. So in the 80s, before new colliders were built there, there was also a technological limit that was overcome by the development of superconducting um, magnets, which made an enormous difference. And um, you, you have to have these fundamental science goals to also um, motivate and push other fields to, um, to overcome these technical limitations, right? So if you, if you want to build a new collider with these and these um, uh, properties, you need to develop these magnets as well. Otherwise it doesn't work, right? So that is, that is a push in, in, in all directions basically to make these experiments work. So there, there are motivations even beyond um, fundamental physics. But I, I am not, I, I'm part of this generation that basically during my lifetime, there were um, three fundamental particles that, yeah. well, not quite true. During my during my uh, adulthood, let's say, there were three particles that were discovered. There was the tau neutrino, the top quark, and the Higgs boson. 
So, so I would say our generation um, uh, isn't quite that spoiled mm -hmm. and has a bit of a different view on this, um, um, on, on these high, very expensive high energy um, experiments. Um, I, I don't see it at all in that way that uh, this is somewhat a disappointment of the Large Hadron Collider. Um, it, it is certainly different from what would have been if we had a couple of resonances that we couldn't explain. Yeah. Um, but there are even some anomalies that have been seen for which we have no explanation at the moment, for which we want to drill deeper and understand what they really mean for particle physics and whether they maybe point to a new scale that we haven't yet understood. LHCB um, has been, topic for another day. But yeah, been making noises about... Um, uh, what, what's the word? Uh, lepton universality and things like this, which we need to to kind of keep an eye on. So, uh, you know, that's that's where my hope for LHCB is. So we'll we'll see. That one one just before we finish, one really nice um, analogy that you push back. Well, not analogy, just fact. Really, is that had LEPS energy been only five percent uh, higher, then it would have probably discovered the Higgs boson. So we. We never really know, do we, when we're when we're below a threshold of new physics, of new particles to be discovered. Nature, we can come up with all these fantastic motivations and we probably knew the Higgs was knocking around somewhere. So we had a really good idea. But nature has a way of sort of kicking us up the backside and, and, and throwing some curveballs that we we don't have in any of our theories and in any of our thinking. So it's always worth having a look at the uh, at the next scale if it's. Uh, if it's something that we're we're able to do technologically, yeah, there there um, there are two colliders that basically were in hand reach of the Higgs boson mm -hmm. that just 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 came short of actually discovering. And LEP is one of them. It just had a the, the final energy of LEP was five percent below, which would have been needed. It's an electron-positron collider, so it, it operates at a fixed energy, mm -hmm. and it didn't discover it. Um, it could produce uh, um, couldn't produce something of the of the mass of the Higgs boson really. Yeah. yeah. And um, the other is the Tevatron. The Tevatron is um, the biggest collider that was ever built in the United States. Um, it, its energy was seven times less that of the Large Hadron Collider, but definitely high enough to produce the Higgs boson. But because the Higgs happened to be at the point where it was, so so Tevatron actually tested quite a large range yeah. of masses. Yeah. It was very important in um, in pointing towards the right spot to look at. Yeah. But it was not energetic enough to produce enough Higgs bosons to um, kind of uh, get it out of this mess of background that a Hadron Collider has to be convinced that it's there. They had a signal in the end even, it just it wasn't statistically significant enough to, to give you confidence that there is a Higgs boson, um, even your, though you suspected it. But if it had run even one more year, um, people were very confident that it would have gotten it. Um, at that point, LHC started running and um, it, it was probably a good decision to shut Havertron down because it was... Uh, um, it, it was just not competitive with what the Large Hadron Collider could do. Mm. But yeah, it's, um, it, it goes to show that, um, and that of course is true in both directions, right? Sometimes we expect something and we, we, we don't find it because nature um, has decided uh, that it's not going to be there. Maybe it's elsewhere, but it's not where we look for it. Um, on the other hand, sometimes we test all we can and just come short, we close enough, but don't discover something so as important as the Higgs boson. Yeah, I like to keep that 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 nice balance between the experimentalists and the and and the theoreticians. Sometimes you guys have theories, we go and find what confirms the theories. Sometimes we throw you some curveballs, and then you have to try and understand what's going on with what we found. But it's that beautiful interplay between the two. And sometimes we just get something we don't expect, and we uh, we have to scramble to catch up. Martin, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, chatting with you again. There's so much more we need to find out about the the Higgs and its related interactions and I think that's gonna that's gonna keep us busy for uh for a long long time so uh thank you so much for talking to me again I've learned an awful lot as ever um I'm gonna make sure Martin's um contacts his work his uh excellent conversation piece are down in the description Martin do you want to to point anyone um anywhere to learn more about the the Higgs boson or the work that you're doing so the yeah, if you can, you can include that nature uh, article as yes, well I because do, I, yeah. I assume that your the people that watch your um, channel are very well informed, and <laughs> that one aims a bit higher, um, yeah. basically to some uh, to some degree. So I would people recommend to go there too. And I want to mention Stephen Jones, who is the other author of the conversation yes. article. I That's didn't right. write that one yeah. alone, so um, uh, that should also not um, uh, that should also be mentioned. Correct. Um, other than that, I just uh, thank you for having your, uh, me on again. 
um, it was a lot of fun to chat with you and uh, I'm happy to be back in the future. Yeah, it's always it's always a pleasure, Martin. Thank you so much again. And uh, yeah, next time uh, something comes down the pipe, hopefully from LHCB next time, fingers crossed, we will uh, we will get you back and we'll uh, dig into it and work out what's going on. So have a have a wonderful Friday. Have a have a wonderful weekend. And uh, let's talk again soon, buddy. You too. Great weekend. You too. Take care. Bye now. Bye. I want to know what you think, because you're the scholars of enlightenment that I do this for. So please take a moment, if you wish, to let me know down in the comment section. And if you like this video, please consider leaving a like, subscribing, setting up notifications, and sharing this video more widely. I can't tell you how much these simple actions help me out and how much I'd appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being scientific. Thanks for being bad.